Hello folks, today I'm going to be demonstrating my use of creating a grading system and I've done it in a couple of different ways to create a couple of dip different demonstrations and we will get into that in a little moment. But first, let us start with the main program for the main part of the presentation, which is called anjump.py. This particular program right here is designed to be implemented in as few lines as possible. As you probably have figured out by now, the number of lines that you create can substantially impact the speed of the program. However, in this case, we have a program which does not necessarily require speed. So ultimately, it's not very necessary. However, I wanted to demonstrate its possibility anyway. And we start with this first program here. It's written on as few as 11 lines. Number 12 and 13 do not count. The code begins with an infinite loop, which ensures that the program continuously listens for input. The design is particularly useful in applications that require repeated interactions until a specific termination condition is met. Within this infinite loop, an empty grade list is initialized. This allows the grades that are entered by the user to be stored in the list which gets stored in the memory. The walrus operator is a relatively new operator which allows you to instruct this input within the while statement. That's something that was added later on to Python 3.8 and above. Because of the walrus operator, which is the little semicolon with the equal sign, the script enters a nested loop that utilizes the assignment expression to receive user input. The input is stored in a variable called gin. That basically means grade input shortened into gin to make the code as few characters as possible. And the loop continues as long as the user does not enter D, which represents done in this case. Inside this loop, the program attempts to convert the input gen into a float and checks if it is below 65. If it is, the script adds 10 to the grade for adjustment purposes. This adjusted grade is then appended to the, the list, the initial list. The float conversion is crucial as it ensures that non-numeric inputs do not cause type errors during calculations. Using value error, this program actually has a very basic error handling implemented into it. Should the user enter a value that cannot be converted into a float, except for the termination command as D, the program raises a value error. In this case, the program responds by printing X indicating invalid input. Once the user finishes inputting grades by entering D, the program checks if any grades were collected in the list. If the list contains grades, it calculates and prints the average, minimum, maximum, and various of the grades using form, the formatted output for clarity. The calculations are performed as follows. The average is calculated by summing all the grades and dividing the number of grades. The minimum and maximum functions find the lowest and highest grades in the list. These are built into Python. 
to allow you to do that. The various is computed as the difference between the maximum and the minimum grades. These are all implemented onto one line using one print function. And finally, if no grades were entered and the list remains empty, the outer loop breaks, effectively ending the program. Now, just to sh demonstrate that every line of code and every bit of text that you enter into the code actually does make a difference. If we move over to the next program called Erasing Pop and we run it, this version of the program has the two, the two variations of the code. One with the walrus operator that shortens it by one line and another version which uses an older way, an older methodology. And when we run the two, you will notice underneath the output shows the time differences between the two programs running and you will see that there is actually a slight deviation. While this deviation has an insignificant impact on this type of code, especially with the amount of computer power that we have today, if you were to imagine code, many millions of lines of code running, all those millions of lines of code would actually make a difference in the timing. So that is something to take into consideration. Although I wouldn't necessarily hold it to a high standard unless you are working with perhaps medical equipment or something where every little nanosecond makes a huge difference. Now I want to explain to you another version of the code which is more heavily involved it does not take into consideration the speed of it necessarily but more accounts for functionality. In this version of the program, I called it flosp.py. This program is the same grading system and does the same exact thing except it has additional functions involved. This version of the program imports statements which are built into libraries which happen to be part of the Python libraries that are available for the interpreter that I used, which is Thani. It first imports uh, logging functions, datetime functions, OS functions. It provides a way for Python to interact with the operating system, to create a logging system, and to handle date and time operations which will be used in the logging process. The program first initializes the logging system which is the logging.basics config. That's the command that you use the call function to get it set it up properly and below you can see file name equals link and log.txt. That's just what I decided to call the logging file and when the program is run it will create that link and log.txt file and it will initialize different configurations that are all built in. Info is just a, a configuration level that automates uh, the type of logging that gets logged into it and the format is formatted accordingly. That is the first step of the process. The next part of the program creates a logo which I used an ASCII, sorry, I used a, a picture to ASCII art generator that I found online to create it. Since this is a floss grading system, I thought it was appropriate to reference Waterpik. I think they're amazing devices and everyone should have one if they uh, have the resources to make that happen. Uh, the, the logo generates, it creates string into a printed text and that calls later on in the main part of the function 
down below. Another important thing that this version of the code does is it has some basic sanitation input. This is good for preventing cross-script attacks. Uh, if anyone is ever familiar with people injecting certain types of code into forms or anything online, uh, that gets it to activate uh, a certain commands in the background that it aren't normally supposed to be activated and get it to behave in a way that it wasn't originally intended. For this grading system, the sanitation sorts through uh, characters that are not approved. So basically anything that isn't a numerical input or a negative number or any of the commands that I preset in order to determine to end the loop of inputting values, it will basically ignore all those inputs and it won't do anything with those inputs and that's very important to prevent cross-site scripting attacks. This program is also very scalable since everything is separated into their own built functions. And you will also notice that the grades are inputted as tuples. So instead of creating a list that gets updated, it creates two versions of the list. One for inputting the values exactly as the user inputs them. And they get inputted as tuples, which means that they are immutable. They cannot be changed. So in order to change them, you have to create a copy of it. And that copy can be modified. That way the original is protected from the program accidentally modifying the original values. While this might not be super significant for this specific program, it could be very useful later on when the program starts to get bigger and get more complex and you start losing track of everything. When designing the code and how it flows, you have to really consider how things pass through things. And that's essentially what we're doing here when we create loops and when we create, create statements. We are sending data to be passed through systems that we create that potentially modify its behavior or otherwise alter it in some form or log its information or whatever the case may be. But when you have things like a logging system or anything like that, the, the flow of the data has to pass through those systems in order to connect their functionality to whatever it is that you're doing. Since it's a logging system here, the logging system is always called upon when there's an issue for every part of the process in order to log that data into the text file. Otherwise, the loop then uh, passes through other logic that's designed. For example, here we have the average, lowest, highest, and variance. They're all functions built right into Python and very useful. And the way that it's done is very simple and straightforward and there's not much to it. You just have to go over to your favorite AI processing facility and you know, generate some the right types of comments and questions to get it to explain to you what the best process to do it and you can use them to break it down further and break it down. And if we go over here, we had some people that were curious how I use AI to enhance my learning experience. So, if we were to go over to Gemini, for example, you can take what you, what you have for code and copy it over and paste it in. Then you might ask it a question like, 
you know, explain to me what's going on here and break it down into further steps. And as it does that, it might not do it very well. You just have to keep on finding new ways to re-ask the same question until it returns a response that's better for you to understand what's going on. And I do a lot of that because it helps me to unpack and unpack and unpack and analyze and study and figure things out. And these language models are very good at doing it. They all have their strengths and weaknesses and I highly recommend utilizing the resource while it's available in a way that benefits your learning experience as much as possible. Like most programs, most programs contain a lot of different types of loops, which will keep on looping until a certain con condition is met. And when you have many parts to the system working simultaneously, they all have loops that are looping, and they're looping through each other. And they'll keep on looping until the, that condition is met or somebody powers off the device, which is not good to do it in that way. Because something can stop in the process and something can get broken. But basically, the, the end result is to make sure that the loop has a, any type of condition that is met in order to stop the program but that in between you have yielded some type of result that you were looking for and used its abilities to accomplish this in this case we have a nice grading system that, you know we have different variations of them they all do the same thing they're just different methods to achieve it and different purposes to keep in mind. You know, for the first one that I showed you, the purpose was merely to demonstrate that creating the same program with as few steps as possible to make it as fast as possible. However, it's not very practical for scalability because in order to build on that, the program would have to be er, essentially modified, completely modified along the way. Whereas the floss.py is more practical in the sense that it is scalable. Uh, everything can be separated into their own definitions. And all you have to do is add a definition to expand on it and then put it into classes. And that's how you get your functioning program that grows and grows and grows, makes it modular, uh, very good for software development. The first one is very good for software development in very specific areas where it is needed for something to be very fast. And But the floss.py is very practical under general and most applications. And that concludes my presentation for this deliverable. Thank you.